Welcome to Hull on Estates, a series of podcasts for the Canadian legal community dealing with issues and insights surrounding estate planning in Canada. Hosted by the lawyers of Hull and Hull, the podcast will touch on some key considerations when planning estates and wills. Now, here are today's hosts. Hi, I'm Gary So, and I'm Darian Murray. Welcome to Hall of the States. You're listening to podcast number 669. How are you, Darian? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Today we're discussing a case involving an attorney for property. It's a case called McKenzie and Morgan. You actually brought this case to my attention. And I actually thought like the facts were super interesting. You want to tell me like um, about the facts in this one and I'll maybe a little bit of why you picked. Yeah, for sure. So like Doreen was saying, she found the facts interesting. I also found them very interesting, which is why I kind of thought it would be an interesting case to blog or yeah, sorry, to do our podcast on. So this case is regarding uh, power of attorney issues. So Miss McKenzie is the attorney for property and personal care for her father, Mr. Morgan, who was diagnosed with dementia. Uh, Mr. Morgan was in a common law relationship with Miss Morgan. Despite having the same last name, they weren't actually married, just in a common law relationship. Um, So Miss McKenzie was contesting that they actually were in a common law relationship, but it doesn't end up being much of an issue in this case because the judge finds it fairly clear that they were in a relationship. Uh, For example, Mr. Morgan proposed and Miss Morgan wore an engagement ring. Mr. Morgan owns three properties and Miss Morgan lives in one of them, which for ease of reference is the Springdale property. So she lives there under a tenancy agreement with Mr. Morgan. She pays him rent and they had a rental agreement drawn up with the assistance of a lawyer. Uh, In Mr. Morgan's will, he included a clause stating that Ms. Morgan can live at the Springdale property for the rest of her life or until she chooses to move out. And then at that point, the uh, property would form part of the residue of the estate. So as a further background to this litigation, there was prior litigation between two of Mr. Morgan's children. Um, Miss McKenzie, who is the applicant in this matter, she was involved in litigation with her twin sister, Miss Dixon. Um, so at the time of that litigation, Miss McKenzie and Miss Dixon were jointly Mr. Morgan's attorneys for property and personal care. Uh, that matter ended up settling, and the settlement involved Miss Dixon stepping down as attorney for property and personal care, and Miss Ken- Miss McKenzie being entitled to live rent free with Mr. Morgan in his home. Uh, that one's the Bracebridge property, and then being paid fifty. 50- $5,500 a month as his caregiver. So the issue now is that Mr. Morgan wasn't sufficiently liquid enough to continue to pay this caregiving fee that Ms. McKenzie had arranged. So he's now in debt to Ms. McKenzie. Um, and Ms. McKenzie is looking to sell the Springdale property because she says Mr. Morgan needs those funds in order to pay her fees and just to sustain his needs in general. So in May of 2022, Ms. McKenzie tried to list the property for sale without consulting with anyone first. And Ms. Morgan refused to vacate the property. So when that happened, Ms. McKenzie applied to the court for a determination on whether she could sell this Springdale property. Um, Like I said, she claims it's necessary to support Mr. Morgan financially. So the issue in this file or in this case, sorry, regards Section 35.1 of the Substitute Decisions Act. Uh, Section 35.1 sub 1 prohibits an attorney for property from disposing of property that's the subject of a specific testamentary gift in a person's will, unless it's necessary to comply with the attorney's duty or it's a gift of property to the person who is entitled to receive it under the will and the gift is permitted by Section 37 of the SDA. So I was interested in this case after I read it because I hadn't really come across anything so far that was regarding kind of the sale of property of a specific gift. So I was intrigued to read this case and then I, when I was speaking to Doreen, we thought that it would be a, a, a great case to do a podcast about. Yeah, because I think like even just from like your background and summary of the case and what the issue is, doesn't matter really, it, like it's such an onion, right? Like there's just so many layers of like we started with like the person at issue, the person who is, you know, in the middle of like a substitute decisions proceeding the person who is incapable and who's under the care of somebody else um this time through a prior attorney we you know we've already heard that 
he has a spouse, a spouse that lives on one of the property where like that spousal relationship is sort of being like questioned and challenged by, you know, Mr. McKenzie, substitute decision maker, POA, one of his daughters, Ms. McKenzie. But then we also hear, oh, previously, actually, there were two POAs appointed. There were like two girls appointed to act together. And then when those two girls couldn't come to an agreement about how Mr. McKenzie should be taken care of, there was like that prior proceeding and it led to a court order and a court order that resulted in, you know, monies being paid to the POA, POA being able to like live rent free on one of the properties. And then all of a sudden, again, the order is not working out. There isn't enough money. And all of a sudden this goes back into court. And so the complexity of all of this is where I actually found it the most interesting rather than even the application of section 35.1 in and of itself. Because it really just goes to show you how complicated life can be at the individual and at the family level. Because, like, so far we've only actually talked about, like, two kids or actually five kids. There's three properties. And so, like, it's a pretty big, like, cast of players. And it's really obvious when you read this decision that everybody's fine. Poor Mr. McKenzie, he's 85 years old. He has dementia. There are medical reports about him like needing like a lot of help with like all of his activities of daily living. But everybody in his orbit are essentially fighting each other. Um, at least they're not fighting him, but they're in a disagreement about sort of like how he is living his life, where he lives it. Um, who he gets to see because like access amongst like all the different children and with Miss Morgan is also like another issue and you know then it just, again always comes down to the finances um, but because it any cases about section 35 per one it, it's generally on the rare side because I think it really should be and like the reason why that particular provision of like the SDA is there is actually like a really important one because it's all about not defeating the incapable person's testamentary intentions. They were intentions that were put into place, like someone took the time, went to a lawyer, got a will done, said this is what like she wants when they die. And then becomes incapable after that point in time, then what can what can their like POA or guardian do? Can they then still sell off a property, even though in the will says like, oh, Miss Morgan gets to live in this property under the same tenancy agreement as they had like during Mackenzie's life for the rest of her life, or you can actually sell but you know the SDA also recognizes that like over time in the course of a person's life you might not be able to hang on to every single piece of property that you have like financial circumstances and like you know the current like economy could just be that you can't keep everything right like you might actually have a testator that wants his wife very specifically to have the house when he dies mm -hmm. that makes so much sense but what if a couple really only has this one house like that's the only asset really like, or major asset of their marriage and like they both need money for their like own care and to live like what if like you know the husband needs like money for like some like you know more private care or to just like be in a new home with like better equipment like for his needs and like the wife has, like, her own, like, medical care needs as well. And so, like, that's why the act goes through the analysis of, like, is it necessary? Is there something else that can be done before you sell off this asset that's, like, subject to a gift? And even when you do and it is necessary, then, like, what happens with the money? So, yeah. What do, what do you think, like, the court really actually went through in their analysis? So I think in this case, it really hinged on the fact that the judge didn't necessarily 
100 percent believe Miss McKenzie's evidence and her reliability. Um, there were some issues when in her original application materials, Miss McKenzie had listed out all of Mr. Morgan's assets, his expenses, his income, and she said his shortfall was about 150000 a year. Um, but then when this matter came before the judge in October, the values that Miss McKenzie assigned to Mr. Morgan's assets were significantly lower than what she had originally said. And I, there wasn't much uh, documentary proof to back up those valuations. So the judge was concerned about that and that reliability. She also had a lot of issues with Miss McKenzie's actions in general. Um, for example, Miss McKenzie listed this Brindale property for sale without consulting with anyone for, say, any of her siblings. Um, Miss Morgan, she didn't speak to either. And when there was an issue, she just immediately applied to the court for direction, knowing very well that her father wasn't able to afford that. And even the deal she negotiated in the previous settlement uh, to be paid herself as a caregiver and then to live rent free in the property as well, she knew she, her father wouldn't be able to afford that either. Um, she, The judge also discussed her duty to consult with her siblings and said that she hadn't spoken to anyone to try and determine uh, you know, other ways to free up assets. Interestingly, Miss McKenzie argued that she only had a duty to consult supportive family members as per the Substitute Decisions Act. Um, but the judge said that as per her reading of the Substitute Dish Decisions Act, it means supportive to the incapable person and not supportive to the attorney for property. Um, and the judge also looked at to the fact that there were other options to fund Mr. Morgan's care. Uh, they could have moved him into a long-term care home. That would have also helped to kind of alleviate some of those issues between the siblings with who was getting to see him and access to him and that kind of thing. Um, and it would have been much more affordable. Mr. Morgan did own a third property that no one lived in, so that could have been sold. Um, and then the room that Miss McKenzie was living in, in that Bracebridge property, that could have been either rented out or she could have started paying rent. So and given all these issues, the fact that Miss McKenzie didn't look to try and figure out kind of any other option, she just immediately went to the sale of the Springdale property. The judge also found that there was a lot of animosity between uh, coming from Miss Morgan to Miss McKenzie, or sorry, coming from Miss McKenzie. Kenzie to Miss Morgan, she thought that kind of played into her decision making as well. So it really came down to the actions of Miss McKenzie um, as to why the judge found that it wasn't necessary, absolutely necessary to be selling that property. There were potential other options to fund Mr. Morgan's care. And like the court did leave it open ended for, you know, someone mm -hmm. else to like portray this back to court via Miss McKenzie herself at her later date with better evidence to like. Yeah, like, okay, no, no, this really is necessary. But I think at the end, the court was rightfully extremely cautious because of also like the conflict of interest at issue, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you think about it, the person that's in being in charge of this incapable person is also someone who lives on his property rent free, is like receiving her own income from him. And like, so sure, of course, she's going to want to protect that property where she's living um and protect that income even though like at the end of the day like that might very well not be miss mckenzie's intentions or in intentions could just be like actually beyond reproach but you know on paper that is kind of a starting point that like the court has to be really really mm -hmm. critical with and it then becomes something the court also really struggles with because there's nobody else putting forward evidence like say on Mr. McKenzie's behalf and maybe like what he wants aside from like see like the evidence from Miss Morgan and she also had evidence from like see the other family members but at the end of the day you know when it comes to the powers and obligations of the substitute decision maker like a power retreat or a guardianship of property you really really have to refer back to the substitute decision back and it's actually good for people to say like always have counsel even before you take any major steps of just like a selling of an asset because this idea that Ms. McKenzie just put up a for sale sign didn't consult with anybody um didn't factor in like Ms. Morgan's like testamentary gift well that was something that also like I, I think it you know when it goes to court or something like, you know, maybe like 
that just didn't really like. Right? Like, um, and so it's always better just to be aware of those obligations before you bring like the matter to a head. Um, and if it is actually necessary, if it is found to be necessary by a court, the sale of an asset like this, there is another provision under the SDA at section 36 that deals with what happens to like the proceeds of sale. So like under my same earlier scenario about you know, like that married couple, the husband's incapable, the wife has his EOA and they just together have this like one house and it's really necessary, really actually for the both of them to sell. Well, then what happens to like the proceeds of disposition? To the extent that there is any of like the proceeds left, the proceeds like will go to like the person that it was intended for, like in lieu of like the actual asset itself. And if at the end of the day there isn't enough of a residue left, you still pay out the full proceeds of sale. You that the person who gets the gift under the will will still get like a rateable amount of what's left in the residue. So, like, the legislation still recognizes, like, hey, a gift was intended here, and it is trying to do, like, the most, like, objective, as well as reasonable saying as to, like, well, what happens just, like, when things change and you do to sell. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for listening to our podcast. Until next time, I am Doreen So. And I'm Darian Murray. If you have any questions, please email us at info at hollandhold.com or contact us through the contact page on our website. Thanks. Thanks. This has been Hull on Estates with the lawyers of Hull and Hull. The podcast you have been listening to has been provided as an information service. It is a summary of current legal issues in estates and estate planning. It is not legal advice, and you are reminded to always talk with a legal professional regarding your specific circumstances. To listen to other podcasts or to leave a question or comment, please visit our website at hullandhull.com. Our theme music is Upper Structure by DJ A Kid and is courtesy of the Podsafe Music Network.